Hello, welcome to Nursing 234, Intravenous Therapy, Chapter 29. Um, it doesn't cover the whole chapter, it only covers up until page 785 and starts on 751. Don't forget with your um, Perry and Potter book that you purchased last year, it's the same book, 9th edition. It's more than just a textbook. On the front cover, there you can go on their website and get videos, case studies, calculation tutorials, and everything else, questions, and printable key points. So, also, if you have questions, I hope you remember where my office is, so you can stop by between 8 through 4, Monday through Friday, or always email me if you have questions. Thanks. Bye. On this slide, intravenous therapy, the IV of IV therapy is to maintain or prevent fluid and electrolyte imbalances. We can administer medication, replenish blood volume, which is skill number three, assist in pain management, and do hemodynamic uh, monitoring, which is done in like an ICU or ER. We also need to follow the six rights when administering parenteral solutions or any medications. So don't forget those from last year, right person, right um, medicine, right time, right dose, right calculation, right documentation. When our patients need an IV catheter, intravenous venous access device, we need to know what is the best for the patient and various ways we can choose that is based on the prescribed therapy the patient has ordered by the physician the length of treatment, so if it's two days versus six months or a year, the duration of the device remaining in place, the patient's preference and location, if they um, have bigger veins on the left side of the arm, we want to use their left side. Now, if they're having surgery, say, on their left side of the body and having maybe a mastectomy on the left side, we want to use that right arm. And we also need to know the resources available to care for the patient while they're in the hospital and if the patient's going to be discharged home after the hospital. So for this skill, you're only going to learn about intravenous therapy. We'll go over the central venous access devices and 236 right when you return back from Christmas break. Intravenous solutions, there's three types, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. When we talk about these, the most common you'll see is isotonic, which is the same osmality as body fluids. It's used to replace extracellular volume. So if a patient has like nausea and vomiting, we'll give this type of fluid often. Before you initiate IV fluids, you want to do a good physical assessment. I'll talk about that again later on another slide. Because patients that are getting extra fluid, they're at risk for fluid volume overload. So you always want to do a proper lung assessment or respiratory assessment. Hypotonic fluids, those are great because they hydrate the cells. And 0.45% saline or 0.33% saline is hypotonic. And it can, if it's given too fast, can exacerbate a hypotensive state. Hypertonic solutions, these are to increase the extracellular volume. It's dextrose with 10% water or dextrose 50% with water, 3-5% to 5 saline, so lots and lots of saline mixed in. And so those, when we give these, they're irritating to the vein and also give an increased risk of heart failure and pulmonary edema because you're expanding that intracellular, extracellular volume, the extracellular volume. And Table 29.1 goes over the concentration of isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solutions. As I said before, before you ever initiate IV therapy or IV solutions, you want to verify the order to make sure it's the correct patient and route, documentation, medicine, time, and date. But you also want to complete a thorough physical assessment and review any lab findings. Because if you find an abnormal lab finding, that's not good. Because sometimes IV fluids have potassium mixed in, and if the patient had a critically high potassium and you're giving them IV potassium, that would not be good. Some of the medications that we get from pharmacy are pre-mixed, which is great. 
because they've been added by the manufacturer and there's no risk for human error. Um, the advantages are they increase stability of the solution and there's correct medication and dilutants. The disadvantage, according to your textbook, is it comes in more than one dosage. So like potassium chloride can be 10 milliequivalents or 20 milliequivalents, and you need to check that package thoroughly. As a nurse, you're here for the patient, and you want to provide patient-centered care. You want to communicate and educate your patient, which is essential to the nursing process. You want to have the patient involved in their plan of care. You want to have the patient tell you why they have a venous access device. And before you start an IV, you want to reduce their fear and anxiety, so you need to explain to them what you'll be doing through the steps before and while you do them. Um, explain what touching's involved so the patient's not uncomfortable. The family may want to be present to help reduce the patient. And patients may express pain in a different way when getting stuck with an IV therapy. One of the patients I took care of in the ER, um, she was a previous drug user and thought she was, when I stuck her, she was getting that natural high from doing drugs in the past. Now, I've never had that happen before, but just be aware people react differently. Little kids like to scream at us, which I would too if somebody's coming at me with a needle. And you want to respect religious beliefs also. Evidence-based practice shows you always want to perform hand hygiene before starting an IV site, which makes sense. Then you always want to wear gloves because you're going to come in contact with bloodborne pathogens, possibly. You want to clean the site before you stick them. You want to clean with chlorhexidine because chlorhexidine kills for days while just the alcohol prep kills for hours. You want to remove any venous access devices that aren't um, that need discontinued. You also want to use a catheter stabilization device, and I'll show you when I demonstrate the skill what it is. It's a little clip-on thing. You want to use disinfection caps that the hospital provides, and when we think of the IV tubing, I'll show that more in the video. Uh, when you prime a bag, you use tubing. It's tubing that you prime, and it's good for 96 hours. To be a smart, safe nurse, you want to know the patient's vital signs before initiating IV therapy. You want to know you're not giving them fluid overload. You also want to look at lab values to monitor fluid and electrolyte. Um, fluid overload could be presented in hypertension and bounding impulses. You want to know the patient's medication history, current medications, and therapies. Medications like diuretics and steroids, you'll learn about that in pharmacology, can affect fluid and electrolyte imbalance. You want to also know their previous experience with IV therapy so they're not scared. You want to be aware of prolonged conditions such as exposure to hot, humid weather that can affect a patient's fluid status. You want to ensure that the IV system that they have is intact and that there's no evidence of phlebitis, which is redness and irritation or infiltration is noted. You want to note the date of the last IV administration set and testing change. Oops, sorry, that's my dog. Hey, sorry about my dog barking. Um, you want to ensure that the tubing is good for 96 hours. It could be different depending on where you practice. You want to maintain sterility of the patent IV system, which I'll demonstrate in the video. And you need to understand your risk for bloodborne pathogens as in wearing gloves. Intravenous catheter is shown here. A venous access device, I call it an IV catheter, is inserted into the vein with the final tip residing in a location that's appropriate for the pH and osmolarity of the solution medication. The pH of the medication you're giving should be between 5 and 9. Pharmacy verifies that, so you'll understand that. And table 29.2 on page 755 discusses different types of vascular access devices, but the one here shown in the slide is the most common. This slide here is showing IV catheter size. The bigger the number for the IV catheter size, the actual smaller the needle. So when patients say, I have a 24 gauge needle, the, the barrel of the needle 
the needle actual needle is very tiny whereas a 14 16 and 18 gauge the diameter of the needles lot larger and I'll have samples for you to look at when you come to practice and I'll demonstrate in class clinical indication is on um, the other half of the slide when starting an IV you want to choose the most distal end of the body part you can also put IVs in feet or the head um, it does take special practice to be able to put one in the head you can also put them in the jugular but typically that's done by the physician so if we have a patient's left arm we want to start at the hand and work our way up to like the possible anecubital space you also want to think when you're starting an IV which side of the body you're going to use if somebody is right-handed, you don't want to stick an IV in the right wrist because it's going to bend every time they eat their meal and use their wrist. And push up, and if a patient's going to surgery, maybe they have a right broken shoulder, you want to use the left side. So kind of think about blood pressure rules, too, when you're putting somebody's blood pressure cuff on to avoid the site that the IV is in. Um, when we initiate IV therapy, we want to select the appropriate venous access device to use. Typically, we'll use a peripheral IV catheter. That's what I've been discussing with you. We want to prepare our infusion equipment and understand it. We want to be familiar with the systems we use during infusion, which will be the electronic infusion pump. Um, Hannibal Regional Hospital has those. So... Um, you will need to practice with that twice before you come to check off because if you don't understand how to use the infusion device, electronic infusion device, you will fail your skill and have to come back and remediate with me. And I had to do that to multiple students two years ago. So if you have questions with the pump, come see me. So we're ready to start our IV, which is great. And we want to assess clinical factors and conditions that will respond to the administration of IV fluids. So what we could see is if we're giving IV fluids, their body weight's gonna increase, their urine output's gonna increase, their vital signs are either gonna improve or get, they're gonna go from having a low blood pressure to a higher blood pressure. The pulse is gonna be a weak thready pulse to a strong bounding pulse. Um, if they're getting too much fluid, that's when you'll see those vital signs changes. When we auscultate the lungs, if they're getting too much fluid, we might see distended neck veins along with crackles in the lung. The skin turgor, as we administer if somebody's truly dehydrated, we'll see their skin turgor improve back to normal. Patients may develop edema from fluids, and we can always assess their oral mucosa membranes to see if they were truly dehydrated and they're improving. And we want to assess lab values such as hematocrit, arterial blood gases, and kidney functions like BUN and creatinine. This is all the supplies you'll need for demonstration. I put it on a nice slide for you to see. Um, when I'll just hit some highlights. You want to apply clean gloves all the time when you're starting an IV so you don't come in contact with bloodborne pathogens. You want to apply the tourniquet four to six inches above the selected site and you want to scrub with chlorhexidine for 30 seconds. You don't want to wipe it or blot it dry or blow on it. You also don't want to prepare the site, touch the prepared site, sorry, do not touch the prepared site that you cleaned with chlorhexidine. You want to go at a 10 to 30 degree angle. Handleable regional policy says 5 to 10. You can use local anesthetic. It can be applied 30 minutes before insertion as Emla cream you apply or you can inject 1% lidocaine transdermally on the side of the vein before inserting it but as an ER nurse I don't like to use the 1% lidocaine transdermal because it ends up being two sticks. As a new nurse and continuing nurse to practice never stick more than twice. You want to assess the IV site hourly if they have IV fluids infusing. If not it's every eight hours. Delegation can be initiated to a licensed practical nurse varying where they practice in each state depending on the nurse practice at for LPNs. The task of initiating IV therapy cannot be delegated to nurse assistant personnel. The nurse assistant personnel can inform the nurse if the patient complains of any IV site related complication. 
if the IV set dressing gets wet, or if the electronic infusion device is alarm is beeping. Documentation is key. So you want to record the number of attempts, the site of insertion, the sites that you attempted, the infusion detail, and the patient response to the insertion. So you will need to know that for your checkoff. So an example would be, as the nurse, you'd write on a blank sheet of paper, insert, insert a 20-gauge IV needle into the right antecubital space one, with one stick on 8-16-2018 at 7.41 p.m. That would be a great example. Unexpected outcomes of venous access devices include fluid volume deficit, where they're not getting enough fluid. Fluid volume excess, I've hit on that a lot. It's too large of a volume that infuses into the circulatory system. An electrolyte imbalance, so you're always assessing your labs. You may see a change in mental status, cardiac dysrhythmias, or change in vital signs. If you see any of that, you want to stop the fluid and notify the healthcare provider. Infiltration is the escape of fluid into subcutaneous tissue. It's usually the insertion site is cool to touch, pale, and painful. Your book doesn't mention this, but an extravasation is when chemotherapy agents go into subcutaneous tissue and can cause severe damage to the skin. That's a medical and emergency, so you need to know the health need to notify the health care provider right away. Phlebitis is pain and tenderness at the IV site. You may have bleeding. And the last one is an IV site infection, which is redness, pain, edema, and duration and temperature and drainage. And finally, you may have an air embolism because air got into the circulatory system. This will happen if you do not prime your tubing correctly with fluid and you inject, you attach the saline or fluids to the port and you don't get rid of the air before you attach it to the patient and the patient can die. Cause respiratory arrest, increased heart rate, cyanosis. If you have any questions about unexpected outcomes, just let me know. Special considerations, you want to teach your patient symptoms and symptoms of complication. You want to encourage them to ambulate with the IV pole. Pediatrics, you're going to use a small needle like a 24 to 26 gauge for neonates and 22 to 24 gauge for children. You do not need to know that for the test, so don't focus on that. I mean, you need to, may need help holding a child down to start an IV. Elderly patients, they have fragile veins. So they have less subcutaneous tissue support and their skin is thinning. So avoid sites that can be easily moved or bumped. And home care patients may do IV therapy in the home long term. So they may have something more than just a peripheral IV site. They may have something more long term that we'll talk about next semester. Regulating IV flow rates. We want to do this for accurate infusion rates are essential in the delivery of solutions. Infusion tubing, you have micro drips, which is always 60 micros as little drips, little drops. And it's 60 drops per mil. And a macro drip is 10 to 15 drops per mil. And these are used to deliver rates more than 100 ml an hour. You will have to calculate drips per mil or drips per minute and mils per hour. If the question says the patient has an electronic infusion device, you want to calculate mils per hour. I will demonstrate this in class when I do my lecture, and your book pages for this are 710 to 711. Accurate infusion rates are essential in the delivery of solutions and medications. Changes in the patient's position Flexion of the IV site extremity and occlusion of the IV device influences infusion rates. To prevent this, we may use an electronic infusion device. Um, they measure an electronic infusion device measures amount of fluid over a period of time. An example of this is 100 mils per hour, and it uses positive pressure. These are great for all patients, especially patients at risk for volume overload impaired renal clearance, 
are receiving solutions or medications that require specific hourly volume rate. We also have non-electrical infusion devices. And on the right side of this page is a calibrated chamber that you may see um, in pediatrics. And you just need to monitor the patient closely and the gra it's a gravity infusion. So it goes 36, 36 inches above the insertion shape. These are not used at Hannibal Regional Hospital because sometimes you can just get a bolus of fluid and that's not good. Everything at Hannibal Regional Hospital goes on an electronic infusion device or the old school term is called an IV pump. Electronic infusion devices are amazing. I call them the IV pump, but um, it's programmable software, so you're always getting, on the screen it shows vancomycin, so you program it by the medicine and the milligrams per milliliter, so it's safe for the patient, a lot better than what we used to do. So, we're going to start hanging primary fluids. I'll demonstrate this in a video. But when you hang a primary fluid bag, you need to type in IV fluids. This will make more sense when I do it in class, but just be there. It's set in mils per hour, and you'll be able to calculate the flow weight, rate, sorry, which is mils per hour. Um, each pump has the potential to use add-on syringe pumps, multiple infusion, and administer patient-controlled analgesia. Delegation is the same. It just depends um, if LPNs can do it on their state nurse practice act. It cannot be delegated to nurse assistant personnel. Recording and reporting, you want to um, clear the IV pump every eight hours. At Hannibal Regional, they do it at 2 p.m., 10 p.m., and 0600. Um, you want to report to the change of shift or when leaving on a break the rate and volume left in the infusion bag because it could, what if the patient messes with the pump or something? So just be aware of that. And you want to document the when you clear the pump as that is intake because it's IV fluids. Unexpected outcomes of intravenous flow rates. Um, sudden infusion of large volume of solution can occur. And the patient can develop poor outcomes such as dyspnea, crackles in the lung, or increased urine output. If this happens, if you happen to give a bolus to your patient, um, nurses have been known to get, if you set the pump at 1,000 mils per hour instead of 100 mils per hour, you need to notify the healthcare provider. Um, sometimes infusion rates go slower than orders, so you want to check the IV site. It might be in the bend of the wrist so fluids aren't dripping. Special consideration, you just want to teach the patient if they hear an alarm to turn on their call light and notify you. Um, tell them about factors that affect flow rate if they're bending their wrists. Pediatric, um, you want to always use an infused pump with them because you don't want to risk fluid volume overload. For a pediatric, they use smaller containers, a 250 mil for children less than one. If they're older children, they'll use a 500 mil bag. As patients age, their renal function changes, so just keep that always in the back of your head. And if they're at home and they're doing home care with the IV pump, they need to know how to operate it and have a phone contact number for a patient. When discussing the patient's order for IV fluids, with the healthcare provider, the nurse is informed that the patient will be started on a multiple electro electrolyte solution. What solution should the nurse anticipate will be given? The answer is C, because this is the only solution that's a multiple electrolyte solution. Because sodium chloride, I mean, it is a electrolyte, but it's not a multiple. It's just that's iso it's an isotonic solution that'll go in your vein. When changing IV solutions, um, you're going to change the solution when a new order is received for a new solution. It is time to add a se sequential container to avoid exceeding hang time. You also might have an order just to hang normal saline at 100 mils per hour and it doesn't give a discontinuity. date. So you're going to change that when there's less than 50 mLs left in the bag. You always want to change the fluids every 96 hours along with the tubing. And intermittent fluids are to be changed. The fluid container needs to be changed every 24 hours. 
And I'll show you when there's 50 mils left in the total bag that you also want to change that or if the patient's condition needs it. And this will be demonstrated in the skills presentation video so you'll understand. When changing the IV solution, you want to make sure the next solution is prepared one hour before needing. You need to utilize your two patient identifiers. You want to close the roller clamp on the tubing before spiking. And you want to make sure the drip changer is one-third to one-half full. You want to regulate the flow either using the roller clamp, which is drips per minute, or using the electronic infusion device, which would be mils per hour. You also want to add a time label to place on the tubing. The one shown on this page is not what you Hannibal Regional uses. And they is good for five days. And at HRH, the date initiated is day one. So it's good for five days. And you're going to change it on day five. You also want to review patient allergies. When changing the infusion tubing, you want to maintain sterility, maintain your sterile placement, and it's important to maintain the integrity of the IV system through the conscious use of infection prevention principles. So you don't want to like lick it or lay it on the floor. You do it in the change it in the bathroom. Administration sets are the primary method to carry a solution or medication to the patient. When we talk about changing infusion tubing administration sets, there's three kinds. The first kind that you're going to see, and that's what you need to know for this checkoff, is the primary continuous infusion, which you're going to change every 96 hours for fluids other than lipids or blood products. So HRH policy states five days. They change them every day at 9 p.m. So day one starts before 9 p.m. and then at 9 p.m. is day from 9 p.m. on day two one to 9 p.m. on day two is truly day two and they'll change it in five days. Secondary continuous infusion you might see this not very often but if the secondary tubing is um, continuous you're going to change that every 96 hour if it's not continuous if it's a secondary set where you're just running an antibiotic for two hours in that 24 hour period and disconnecting it from the primary line, you're going to discard that in 24 hours and that would be the intermittent infusion. And you want to change those more often such you want to change them every 24 hours because the increase of infection is high. The risk of getting an infection is high in those. This is just a review. Um, complication of IV solutions. I've talked about this before. Systemic complications can be septicemia, circulatory overload or embolism. Local complications could include phlebitis, trauma to the inner layer of the skin, inflammation. They could have poor assessment or poor technique when they insert the IV, but you will not have that because I'm teaching you. When you're changing a sh short peripheral IV dressing, you want to remove the dressing by pulling up one corner and pulling the sides laterally while holding the catheter hub secure with a non-dominant hand. You want to repeat this on the other side and you want to leave tape for the catheter, catheter stabilization device um, in place that secures the catheter in place and then apply a new dressing. You want to label the dressing and reasons why you may need to change the insertion site is because of leaking or there's blood there and the patient doesn't want to look at it. So just be aware of that. Um, patient education is also key all the time. So just remember any teaching, if the patient thinks their IV site looks abnormal, you need to educate them to notify the nurse. Pediatric patients aren't going to understand IV therapy all the way, so just help them. A parent at the bedside during the procedure helps them or a procedure room, taking them out of their main room to do it is great. Um, geriatrics, I said earlier, had fragile skin, so just be aware of that. And home care patients, just, if they're at home, then we need to teach them how to keep the site dry during a bath or shower. And even at the hospital, we'll do this. If it's in their hand, we'll apply a, um, just a glove that the nurses wear and put tape around it so water doesn't get in and remove it after showering or bathing or um, saran, the plastic saran wrap is good to protect it while bathing. So just make sure they understand all that and make sure if they have any questions be able to answer them or let them find, let you have to find the resource to get to them. 
I will demonstrate discontinuing a short peripheral IV site. Um, you're going to discontinue it when therapy is complete. They no longer need it. They're being discharged home. Or if a complication occurs. Don't use scissors to remove the tape or dressing because you could cut the catheter. That's not a good thing. And the equipment you need is clean gloves, 2 by 2s antiseptic swab. It helps loosen the tape and tape to tape the 2 by 2 down. Remember when you remove an IV catheter, you want to do it slowly and keep it parallel when you pull it out. And I'll demonstrate that in the video. And you want to inspect the catheter for intactness after removal. You want to apply pressure for 30 seconds before you tape the IV site down to make sure the bleeding is done. If the patient is on a blood thinner, you want to hold pressure for 5 to 10 minutes. Delegation. Um, your textbook says this cannot be delegated to a nurse assist assisting personnel, but however, at some hospitals this does vary since your textbook has been written. And just remember, be aware the LPNs may or may not do it depending on their Nurse Practice Act for that state. So this is to help you become familiar with the Baxter IV pump. There's a website you can click on. If it doesn't work, come see me and I'll help get you there to where it does. You will have to enter your email address for this website to work. They don't ever send you emails. I don't get anything from them. I just did it a couple weeks ago to practice. Um, if the keypad becomes locked, the code to get in it is the old school T9 texting KEY, and I'll demonstrate that in class. Um, now remember, we only have one IV pump, so you need to get your two practices in before checkoff week, which is Labor Day weekend, Labor Day week, or you'll have the pump available from 12 to 1 over the lunch hours. But you definitely need to be familiar with the pump to successfully pass the skill checkoff. And we've made it to the end of my skills presentation. You'll have a 15-question quiz from all the textbook pages and these slides. You will also need to know how to calculate drips per minute along with mils per hour. And we're going to do mils per hour only if we have an electronic infusion device. And when you're demonstrating that, you're going to have to demonstrate an IV. You're going to initiate primary fluids with an IV pump, so you'll need to bring a calculator because if long or you have to be able to do math, your mils per hour, and you're also going to discontinue an IV site. So if you have any questions, you need help, you're confused, you're lost, you're not even sure where to find a Perry and Potter book, and you need to buy your new one because you sold your old one, stop by my office, I will help you, or you can email me. And it's a butler at hlg.edu. And I hope you guys have a great semester this year. Thanks.